Hello everyone and welcome back Sur to Watches and Whiskey. Surprise, surprise. It's been a minute since we've done this and we're gonna explain everything to you in just a moment as to why it's taken us so long to get back to this format and why we're doing it live. But this is Watches and Whiskey. So, a few shout outs. I believe we got a Hibiki 21. Shout out Lenny from New York. For a Hibiki 21, excellent whiskey. Shout out to Kinetic for a Glenfiddich 21 Ooh. that they sent us. Amen. And shout out to Unicorn Auctions for a Yamazaki 18, probably one of my favorite Japanese whiskeys out there. Well, actually, I'd have to choose between these two. Which one are we cracking? Why? Uh, well, Why not this one? Huh? Why not that one? Is that going? I was, I was going to go with the well, yeah. Yamazaki 18. I got because I'm putting this home. <laughs> <laughs> so let's put that away, get a couple of glasses going. No ice for this wonderful bottle. Uh, do the honors? Sure, why not? Uh, with pleasure. There you go. While Adrian cracks the Yamazaki, um, I'm going to go into a bit of a apologetic explanation, if you will, as to why you guys haven't seen other content outside of Gray Market. And we're going to talk about Gray Market and what it has done to our lives, how it affected our jobs, our lives, and everything else, right after I take a sip of this juice. Juice. Welcome back, sir. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Pleasure to be back. So, not to spend too much time on this, we. Uh, mm. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I know. This is just. Mm. This is wonderful, wonderful juice. So, not to spend too much time on this, we all know the channel started with what's on my desk. Uh, really started on Instagram, where I started going, oh, what's on my desk? Literally, right. With that said, I uh, turned into a YouTube show. Then gave birth to Q&A, uh, some of my travel vlogs and things of that nature, and then we sort of got away from what's on my desk because it kind of got stale, you know, talking head, there's only so much of that stuff you can watch. Uh, and we got into Watches and Whiskey where we answered questions, where we discussed current market conditions, a lot of the stuff that I spoke about on what's on my desk, but then I decided to obviously include Adrian as well because, you know, two opinions are better than one regardless of how you look at it, even though most of the time. You did all the talking? And we disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Literally on everything. <laughs> so with that said, a lot of you guys have been commenting saying, hey, we want to see what's on my desk. Gray Market has taken over the entire thing, and we'll explain why. Uh, we are about 12 episodes in right now, Chelsea. But we're 12 episodes in. Uh, those 12 episodes equate to three months. The first two months, I would say, of that, uh, Chelsea and Ian both work seven days a week literally seven days a week, probably 12 hours a day to get these episodes out. It's a very difficult schedule to follow, especially when nothing is scripted. You literally have, we've literally had two videographers follow us around all day, every day, travel with us, whether it's a trade show, wherever we may be, New York, et cetera. Then you have to get back home, dump all that footage, rewatch it, try to put it together in a linear episode so it's genuine, right? And that took away a lot of their time. We have since hired one more uh, videographer whom you'll see is it gonna, it's going to be on the next uh, on the next gray market episode. You'll meet another videographer that we hired. Special guy, by the way. Magician. Um, uh, you see, you have to spoil it. You have to spoil it. You have to spoil it. And I would would you say that me and you got back to normal? Maybe within the last thirty days, in terms of getting our jobs done and not waking up in the morning and thinking about cameras in our face and thinking about you know what are we going to film today? What are we not going to film? Because I will for one agree. Uh, well, I will for one say that gray market took away from my work. I've said it before, when I did the What's On My Desk, me and you did Watches and Whiskey or Q&As, we, it took maybe four to five hours of my time per week. With the introduction of gray market, I myself found, you know, waking up in the morning going, oh my God, what am I gonna take today? How's this gonna look? And I was concentrated on the video aspect of it, or the media aspect of it, rather than my job, and I found that it took away from my job. What about right. you? Uh, actually, on the contrary, because, it, Actually, the opposite happens with me because a lot of times the production team gets me, hey, Adrian, we, you got to turn your mic on, you got to turn your camera on your desk because we need X footage. But I forget to do that because I'm so busy with my work. So for me, it's the opposite. I need to turn my camera on more. I agree. Right? So, and we, when we spoke in, in great detail how, how important it was for Gray Market not to get away from our jobs. Exactly. And I managed to pull it together uh, and now basically you know my videographers they call me you be the monkey let us do what we do and allow the videographers to be that fly on the wall so that i'm actually doing what i need to be doing whether i'm answering messages or making phone calls or traveling and at this point i don't even notice them but that's why we hired a third videographer because a i think ian was going to have a nervous breakdown chelsea was about to go looking for another job and luckily the things have settled <laughs> down and they're still here hi chelsea 
I am. Chelsea uh, saved our life. If you guys have seen one great yes, market episode. And, and the fact that she stuck around. Thank you for sticking around. She, she saved our life in Atlanta. <laughs> but what I'm here to tell you, again, it's, it's not an apology for say, but it's more of an explanation. What I am here to tell you is the following. Uh, when it comes to gray market, there's really not much that can replace what's on my desk. One thing we're going to try to do going forward is we're going to try to uh, really show a bit more of the watches, give a bit more of an explanation on the watches, maybe in the form of me schooling some of the younger salespeople, right? I think that's a good way to do it and it'll allow the viewer to mm -hmm. see, you know, a little more, more detail on the watch porn and some of the watches that I used to show. If we're going to get really special watches, like the Grand Comp, one of a kind that we mm -hmm. just got, right? We're gonna make sure that we put it on the watches and whiskey. So watches and whiskey is not going away. We're gonna do this live, maybe every couple of weeks, maybe not every week, it's very difficult to do so. And the reason we're doing it live is because there's zero production behind it. Meaning that guys turn on the camera, me and Adrian sit down, we start talking, there's your watches and whiskey, right? right? They don't have to go back, they don't have to edit it, they don't have to fix anything, they don't have to do any of those things. Hey, how are you? With that said, there's your watches and whiskey. Q&A. Haven't spoken with Avi, haven't spoken with Nick from marketing, and haven't spoken with Adrian. We decided that it's going to be a joint effort, meaning that I'm not going to be the only one doing Q&As. It's going to be a joint effort as we do here on Watches and Whiskey, and we're going to put it out in format of a podcast. The podcast already exists. Uh, uh, Avi already set it up, and what he's done is he recycled some of the older Q&As. He put it out on the podcast. I think we already have uh, 1,500 downloads or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can commit one hour every week, along with Adrian, to uh, that particular podcast. Again, and the idea behind it is that there's no video production, there's no color correction, there's no videographers involved. It's just literally me sitting down, reading off the questions, answering them off the cuff, like I always did on video, but it will not require anyone to go through and edit that stuff. Mm -hmm. Therefore, not taking any time away. And that's going to allow us to continue gray market going. Uh, in the pace that we're doing it at. And the pace is brutal, boys and girls. It's, we tape uh, starting Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's our taping week, five days. There's something in between on the weekend, like this weekend, we're going to IWJG, Ian's flying with us, right? Then we tape through the weekend. And we have a creative meeting every Wednesday when taping is finished. We sit down, we go through the footage that was taken, we figure out what was good, what was bad. Of course, Ian collects all the bloopers and outtakes and <laughs> and we put out an episode as you see it. The editing is not as heavy. What is heavy is the amount of footage. If you consider the fact that, uh, Chelsea, how many hours of footage would you say gets collected for an average gray market episode? How much? Like five hours a day. Five hours a day. That's 25 hours of footage that a videographer has to go through and watch before they edit it. Think of that. Think of how, how long does it take to download that onto a computer? You know, it's hours, right? So we're, I think we got it figured out at this point. I hope you guys are happy with Gray Market, but I just wanted to come back and say that, look, Watches of Whiskey is not dead, Q&A is not dead, and we're gonna try to incorporate the watch porn, the knowledge, and a lot of the stuff that we talked about on what's on my desk into some of the other episodes. There's almost not enough Don't. time in a day to try to, for, for this whole creative process, you know, when do you include this, when do you, when do you include that? Especially, as a matter of fact, Gray Market has made my job a lot harder, but in a, in a good way, because of the exposure that we've been getting, and the amount of just requests that people have to buy, sell, or trade their watches just keeps me up at all hours of the day. It's a 24-7 business at this but, point. And speaking, and so speaking, whole and speaking of which, one of the topics me and Adrian wanted to discuss today, uh, we often, when I say often, very, very often, probably top five questions is what? How do I become a watch dealer? How, I, how do I get into the watch business? Uh, can someone be my mentor? Blah, 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 blah and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And uh, I think that we're going to shed a little more light into that via a video that's coming out next week where we, uh, I was actually away in um, Ukraine uh, for 11 days and the spotlight was on Adrian and we literally followed Adrian from the minute that he wakes up. We're talking 4 a.m. up, right? And you guys are going to see what it actually takes to be, uh, what it's like to be in his shoes. I don't want to spoil anything. You guys will see that next week, is it? Or the following? The following week. So that episode comes out, not this Monday coming up, but the following Monday. And you're going to see what it's like to be in the shoes of Adrian. Also, a lot of complaints about Alex. It doesn't seem like he wants the job. I saw some comments saying, oh, this kid doesn't seem like he wants it that bad. He's so quiet and this, that, and that. It's his personality. But WhatsApp this kid at 4 a.m. in the morning and find out whether he's up or not, and he will be up. This morning, I think our first conversation between me and Alex in the sales group was at 6, 11 a.m. So it is a hard job, let's start there. But in mm -hmm. your opinion, what does it take 
to get, if somebody today just came to you and said, I don't care what it is, I want to get into this business, what does it take? Just burning passion for what you do. There, there, there's no other way around. If you don't like what you do, you're never going to be successful. Because especially starting off in the watch business, there's so much information that you need to take in from market prices, reference numbers, where to get this, logistics, shipping, payments. It's there, there. I mean, you could write a whole book on it. What, what does it take? It takes a lot. Just like any other industry. There's nothing special about our industry. If you anything you do in life, you have to work. 24-7 with it. This is a 24-7 game. This is not a nine to five, you know. There's no, we leave here at five and then I come back to work at nine. It's a, it's a re revolving process. It never, it never ends. I haven't had a vacation in 10 years probably. Uh, and if you think that you know my I mean? phone didn't blow up, I actually, uh, <laughs> it's funny, but we're sitting, um, we're sitting at dinner. It was, uh, s I guess it was around uh, 7 p.m. Ukraine time, which made it 12 p.m. Uh, U.S. time. And as usual, my wife is like, put your phone down, put your phone down. And I did an experiment. I said, okay. I said, I'm gonna put my phone down for 30 minutes. Yeah. My nephew's uh, mother-in-law was there and and she's complaining to her going, oh my God, he, al he always gets these messages and it's, it's, he's always on his phone and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, you wanna see an experiment? To my uh, nephew's mother-in-law. I put my phone down, I said, set a timer for 30 minutes on your phone. She set a timer on the, on the phone. I said, look, I'm gonna flip my phone over. I flipped my phone over and I didn't look at it and I, and I just went like this. I said, look, when she looked at the amount of WhatsApp messages, text messages, yeah, voicemails yeah. and this, that and the other, she was like, holy crap. Yeah, How do we, it takes a special nerve to deal with that. It's uh, a lot of uh, fear of missing out, like every jumping on your phone with all these it, group yeah. chats and this, that and the other. It takes a certain, I feel like it takes a certain, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I mean, you're, we're, we're conditioned to, conditioned, to be, yeah. we're, we're conditioned to be like this, you know, it's, you know, it starts off as an anxiety, you know, I don't want to miss this deal. But at the end of the day, if you don't get back to said person, then somebody else will. That's kind of the mindset that you have to have, you know. As successful as we are as a company, we're growing at a rapid pace and it's getting even more difficult. That's why we brought up, we brought in a lot more help, Alex, Nick, uh, Hakib, and hopefully we're going to bring a lot more people on because it's just, it's... If you guys, if you guys remember, um, you know, our previous videos, even before Gray Market started, me and Adrian talked about taking the company into a different direction, right? Going from being predominantly a wholesale company to a retail company. Since I think we spoke about that, we've gotten to a point where at the beginning we were 85 wholesale, 50% retail. I think at this point- We surpassed we're sur it. We're surpassed- In a much quicker time than we thought. Yeah, the halfway mark. And honestly, thankfully to you guys, the yeah. audience, right? The, the exposure that we received via our YouTube channel since before Gray Market is what allowed us to do that. My other ultimate goal that you guys heard me say on Gray Market was to go from a $100 million company to a $300 million company, maybe not overnight, maybe not in one year. And my biggest fear was is that the minute I got away from wholesale, because listen, with wholesale, you just sell a lot more, the revenue is much mm -hmm. larger. So I knew that the revenue aspect of things will take a hit because there's less wholesale, right? Yeah, the margins will go up slightly, although lately there's not much of a difference between retail and wholesale, but I was afraid that that revenue is gonna take a hit. And I'm happy to tell you guys that I looked at the numbers, well, actually we did it with Adrian uh, last week, we are on pace to go to roughly about 140 plus this year, uh, right. which is my expectations were to go from 100 million to maybe this year to 125, 130. It's a huge and, jump in and, any industry. Exactly. You know? And again, mainly thanks to you guys, our clients uh, slash audience, uh, because the retail space is uh, loyal, if you will. Uh, once, uh, once you make a client, because we sell such high-end items and it's and the, and the it's so personal it's almost like when you meet a client you know he becomes part of your life right like mm -hmm. a personal friend etc cetera, etc cetera. so i guess to go back to the original question communication and knowledge i think is key this is exactly what you said in the very beginning the very first statement you made is learning yeah right and which is what we push uh the kids as we call them we push them to that educating your consumer so when I ask Alex, uh, you know, three times in a row, what is a quantine perpetual versus a regular perpetual? And he kind of like, you know, rolls his eyes at me like a kid in school. And I explained to him is that that question will come up. That question will come up in conversation. That may be a statement that you make to a client, a piece of information that he did not know. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, that's how you create that personal relationship. So you have to be somebody who is willing to go far and beyond to learn on your own consistently. The learning doesn't stop. I've been doing this for 20 years. There's a new watch that comes out every every other day that may have something new in it, and I need to know about it. Mm -hmm. New brands, new models, this, that. Not memorizing reference numbers like you guys like to do. 
right? reference, reference was retail prices, yeah, market prices. retail prices, market prices. I also, th I, th I also think that it's, it's it's very important nowadays, especially if you want to jump into the watch business, not to not to follow the herd. Whenever the, the majority of people who get into the watch business, they do the same exact thing. And what is that? Uh, they start flipping steel Rolexes. You know what I mean? If I was to start today, well, also it's easy for me to say because I know the market. I would probably start with something, you know, working with a lot of indie brands, you know, following passion with them because there's not so much of a market for that, right? MVNFs, the Dibithunes, really learning that market, acquiring those pieces because then you're kind of separating yourselves from the herd. To compete with everybody selling steel Rolexes, it's, I would never do it. There's no, there's no money to be made. No and, and I'll mind you that. Our Rolex business went up significantly over the last year, I would say, simply due to the fact that we have the ability to shift and diversify. But that doesn't mean we stop selling all the other stuff we always sold. Uh, think of it as a big bucket of money, right? And if, I, if I'm working with a total sum of a dollar, right, I am going to take that dollar and stretch it across multiple buckets, diversifying within our, in the, within our own business. For us, it's watches, jewelry, and accessories, first and foremost. Then we get into various brands, various price points, and things of that nature. But that's on a big scale. If you are one guy out there, and this is the answer I've given to probably a thousand people over the lifetime of this channel. I said, if you're passionate about XYZ, I don't care if it's watches, I don't care if it's sh uh, shipping containers, whatever it might be, right? Every industry has what we call trade shows. Every industry has places where you can go where there's a congestion of the same people in the business, i.e. 47th Street, the Gold Souk in Dubai, TSD in Hong Kong, and so on and so forth, right? Put yourself in the midst of all that and just pay attention. If you walk into a trade show and if you don't buy a single watch but you talk to 100 dealers and you say hello to 100 dealers, introduce yourself, et cetera, et cetera, what's the matter? We're having technical difficulties over here? No, we're good. You good? All right. All right. That's our, that's our magician. Oh, hold on, hold on. Did you take anything from my pocket? No. So no, hold on, before, 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 <laughs> before, before, before you guys bring this special, we have a special guest here. Before we bring him in, uh, I'm going to finish my thought process. Put yourself... Put yourself in the position of learning. I don't care if you go to a trade show and you don't buy a single watch or sell a single watch. You get to meet X amount of people. This business is built on trust and relationships. This business is also built on a uh, face-to-face, handshake type of environment, right? There's no contracts in our business. You guys have seen this numerous times in our videos. We go out there picking up you know, crazy amounts of watches. We don't sign a single piece of paper. It's just on trust, right? Start, start, working, start working on that. With that said, uh, what else, what other advice? The number one problem that everybody says is, well, I don't have any money. You know, that's, that, that, that is a big problem because especially nowadays, you make your money, you make your sales on inventory you have. I don't care what you say, the broker game, it's, it's, it's such a short-sighted game and it, and it barely ever works. You, Although you, that's you, what started really, this very company, right? And we're it's now slowly a, but surely but, but getting don't, away. Don't from forget it. the market back then compared to what it is right now. It's it's yeah, it's, 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 it's fifty x compared to what it was. You know, listen. There's there's guys out there that that hit the boutiques and uh, they get allocation of watches that make much more money than people that have been in business for ten plus years temporarily. Well, and another thing, another thing is this: there's a reason why everybody wants to get into this business today because the business is on fire. And I've spoken to so many young dealers out there. One of them is about to be a guest on our show. And I told them, guys, like, guys, this is not what our business is like. If you're smart today and you're in this business and you see what's called an abnormal environment, business environment, mm -hmm. we're making abnormal profits. The market is abnormal. Uh, don't think that this is going to happen just the same in the next three years. I'm not going to get into economics, right? But we simply put, economy is a cyclical, right? We all know this. Those that follow it, basic economy understand what's going to happen in the next year to two. Federal Reserve said 2023, most likely they'll hike the rates. Once that happens, due to inflation, obviously once that happens, money, money will be pulled out of the stock market, put into bonds, safe havens, things like that. Stock market's gonna go down, passion assets, i.e. or investments are gonna go down, the demand is gonna go down. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. But economies, again, are very cyclical. The only unknown or the only enigma in this whole equation now is the cryptocurrency. Never, more than ever. We oh, don't know the effect if we, we, anybody, any Joe Schmo will tell you what effect inflation has on markets. It's historical, it's cyclical, it happens over mm -hmm. and over and over. Now we have crypto. My guess, and I'm not going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about, my simple guess is that it's going to have the same effect on crypto as it would on the stock market. Because at the end of the day, if the rates go up and you're a multimillionaire and you have a safe place at 4% a year to park your money that's guaranteed, even though 
it's a false sense of security in a sense. All their that dollars, their dollars not worth exactly. That, it's it is, it's so. literally just covering that you know yeah. loss due to inflation. I get it, but it's still. If I have a if I have a guaranteed five percent a year on my money, and I have a lot of money, versus you know a stock market that's not as stable, you know my bet is going to be to put that money there, right? So maybe we should just change our hoodies to invest in watches. No, no, no. Still not no. giving that advice yet. As far as our guests, we're going to briefly bring some somebody on, all the way out from Texas. Please welcome to the show, Ricky Maduro. <laughs> Ricky, come on. Was that was that too soon? Huh? Was that too soon? The whole What's Texas thing. What's up, puppy? Oh! <laughs> all right, puppy if you guys, eight, puppy What's number up? two. If you guys remember who this kid was, the coin, uh, coin talk. He is the. <laughs> oh, you, did you bring a coin? We're flipping a coin no, today. No, man. <laughs> so you, know, wait, you guys remember the gray market where we flipped the coin and he lost a thousand dollars. Ricky actually uh, called me a couple of days ago on a, on a well, big we watch. We gotta get him a glass. Yeah, we gotta get him a glass. Yeah. Come on, guys. Whiskeys, right? Yes. This is watches and whiskey. Glass, glass. Anyone? I'll take them a bottle. Yeah. <laughs> Not that whiskey, you don't. Okay. See, I wish, I could, pull, I wish I could pull a hat off. It's okay. I wish I could pull a hat off like that. How long have you been in business, Ricky? You know it. Since I sent you an email about a little over a year ago, I sent you an email and asked you, Hey man, I want to get into the business. What to do? So, what better way to answer that question than from somebody that he's one of those guys? Well, I was gonna say one of those annoying guys that kept bombarding and bombarding and bombarding <laughs> until I finally said, okay, fuck it, let's talk. <laughs> and it's been a little bit over a year. I've seen uh, you guys have seen Ricky at the shows. You've seen the inventory that he has. Uh, he, you've seen him offer us inventory. He actually just sold us a watch over a hundred. Is the watch still with you? Did you pull yeah, it? Yeah, I have let's, show, let's show it to the world. Ricky decided to deliver the watch in person. We're going to see each other in Miami two days from now. But he said, you know what? It's an expensive watch. I don't want to ship it armor courier service. I'm just going to come to the office. And we didn't plan on this. And oddly enough, when Nick came to me and said, you know, the, the big topic I want you to discuss on the show is how to get into this business. When Ricky showed up, it's like perfect timing because he himself, based on his own personal experience, will tell you how that happened. In the interim, I called this guy. Oh. The quadricopter. Can we get in on that? Uh, come on, focus. Roger, did we? You guys, I, you guys see me show this on one of my shows. One of my what's on the a while ago. That's probably mm -hmm. about two to three years ago. Ricky, no, we just had one recently, a couple months ago. With, was it a couple months? Yeah, Quintor. No, yeah, it was 2020. 20. We sold it in 2020. We had it here not okay. too long ago. So this is the Roger W. Equator. Exactly. Retail price around four hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Four turbines and one. The joke is, you buy one turbine, you get three for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the things I've told, uh, one of the crazy. things I've told uh, yeah. some of the younger guys in the business before is that there's a much easier way to get into the business. Yeah, the strap with that fire on it. Like, yeah. actually, it's blown. The, one of the things I've spoken to. Guys like Ricky, guys uh, like Nizar that you've seen on my show before, remember the pilot who now turned watch dealer, is I said, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you create relationships by creating a relationship with us. This is not a watch Ricky would necessarily go out and buy for stock. There's no, no fucking way. No there's, way. Just, there's no way he would buy this for stock. But by calling me and saying, hey Roman, what do you pay? I said, I'll pay this, gives him enough room, and I don't care if he made a thousand, a hundred thousand dollars on this watch. There's a price I wanted to pay, he went, bought it under, he has a guaranteed deal. When the show's over, we'll wire him the money and it's a done deal, right? Unless Adrian sells them some Rolexes, but that's besides the point. <laughs> Ricky, do me a favor. The very question that was asked, I can go on and talk about becoming a watch dealer based on a 20-year experience. Tell them from your perspective, from the conversation we had a little bit over a year ago, how did it go? What helped you out along the way? What was your secret for you for oh, to your success? Okay. okay. I remember when, when we had that conversation, you sent me an email and you said, pretty much welcome aboard. You pretty much welcome me aboard the team and said, uh, what you need to do is go ahead and get get a lot of relationships with the uh, all the dealers. So first thing I did was attending to a trade show, and that really helped me out because, as you were saying earlier, I didn't buy any watches, but I was able to talk to a hundred people in there and show Th your face and show my face exactly, and also some of the people I already talk on the chats and stuff. I was able to put the, the face in the in the name, you know, but like at least I had. I had something in advantage that I've been working in the nightclub industry for like 10 years. So usually the people that go to the club and are able to afford $2,000 on, on a table, they can afford a watch, right? So I've been meeting a lot of people in the last 10 years that I'm using those contacts to get get some, some retail outlets. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. it. So that's that's a, he, just made, he just made a very good point. For those of you that are starting to get into the watch industry, I don't care what you're doing. 
uh, right now, there's always some kind of a connection that one can make. Uh, I'll give you an idea. Our guy Akib, right, that just started with us, he's doing customer service. Akib owns a car detailing company and he sometimes details high-end cars. What a good way or gateway to talk to somebody that owns a high-end car to come in and say, like, oh, by the way, I'm now into watches. So if you didn't think you want to sell something, if you want to buy something. I think confidence is a very, very major thing when it comes to this business. You have to portray yeah. yourself as confident. One, so one of the things that Alex, due to his nature of how he talks really, really low, is he doesn't really project confidence, but he has that confidence. It's just the type of person he is, he's just very he's getting, quiet and, and he's very like, he's getting there, he's starting to project as well. I'm actually getting Nick on him to uh, make him start projecting his voice a little more. You know, it's funny, I didn't even know this story about Ricky and he came up to us a few IWJG shows and he started, we started hustling and bargaining together like he's been in business for years. That's you know confident. what I mean? Actually, we got that on camera. I didn't yeah, even know. That's, that's knew confident. the market. We were making trades. And so, to two, uh, Ricky and Nazar, probably two of the notable guys that yeah, kept bombarding me until they got an answer. They were persistent. They're like, no, you're going to answer me, and I'm going to get into IWJG, and I'm going to do all this, and blah, 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 and I'm going to become a member. It's walking, talk, you know, talk, you can talk all you want. You can dream all you want, but, you know, dream big, take small steps to get there. And you know you can achieve whatever dream you have, whether it be a watch dealer, whether it be you know having a restaurant. It doesn't really matter if you put your mind to it and you, you know, go at it. Eventually, you'll come up. What kind of money did you start with? Let's start there. Ten thousand. Ten thousand dollars. How many watches do you have in stock today? Mm, I'll say how much in money. Okay. Close to two hundred thousand. So a, a little over a year ago, started with ten thousand, over two hundred thousand at this point, and had the ability and was able to afford to buy a watch for me that's over a hundred thousand dollars pay for it bring it to me and then i can in turn pay him back for it nazar similar story nazar started with ten thousand went all the way up to 40 took a hit if you remember went all the way back down and now i think nazar is also sitting at around quarter million dollars in inventory maybe somewhere around there which is a great story now the next logical question is going to be like roman you're creating yourself competition right that's what people usually say, like, you know, you give out all this information and, and it's all out there for people to grab. Our business is different because our business is so based on relationships. The only thing I did is I created a relationship that's beneficial to me personally and my company. Just as it is beneficial to Ricky and Nazar and a lot of the other younger dealers out there. And that's what this is all about. I think the watch community is a huge family, if you will, right? It's a it's a trusting family, right? If Ricky didn't fly down here, he would have just shipped this thing to me, right? And this is over $100,000, way over $100,000. So, you know, it's, it's the trust that you develop and it's that family vibe and feel that we have as a dealer community, regardless if you're in the business a year or if you're in the business for 20 years, right? I mean, just like our internal trust between me and you and, and some other salespeople. I entrust my salespeople and my head buyer, Adrian. Adrian makes decisions that can affect the company into the millions daily, literally daily right because he's the head buyer because he spends all the money right and you have to have that trust both on an internal level on the company level and then outside the company and that's what this business is about but i don't think we ever answered the question the, the main i think the main point of how do i get into this business and i think the answer lies within guys like ricky yeah i really really fucking wanted it and i yeah. got what i want right and guess what he flew in he flew out i talked to him six o'clock this morning he flew in, he's flying it back out at 7 p.m. He's gonna get back home, he's gonna do his stuff, and then come Sunday, he's gonna fly out to Miami, yeah. go to the trade what show, I, what I and actually, the game continues. I actually, um, what, what is your Instagram handle, by the way? I have, yeah, I we, have, gotta, we gotta put that up there. The Watch 101. The yeah, Watch so, 101. So one, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is, is, is today you have to get very creative. If you, if you enter the industry, creative via social media or whatever type of content you, you decide to, to release. And Ricky, actually, I, I watch your stories and I actually really enjoy them. He, he's very creative with the stories. I don't know if you've ever seen. He does explanations, he does music, he does all types of stuff, you know, which, which is good because some people just kind of- Must kinda, be the club scene thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some people just kind of fade in, fade into the dark and you just don't hear them and they're, they're, they're too quiet. You gotta be up in people's faces, you gotta be creating content. So I think more on what you yeah. said, entering the game today you, you, it's no longer just, oh, I'm just gonna post a bunch of stuff, do some, a few stories here and there. You can't afford to do that as a newcomer because you gotta do something that's gonna make you stand out from, from uh, the rest of the gang, if you will. Yeah, look at, the, the, look at the Nikos of the world. Exactly. The Watch Eric's, you know, exactly. you guys have. But 
even us having been doing this for 20 years, every single day I have a meeting with marketing say, hey, how can we do something different? How do we do something better? How do we reinvent this? And how do we, just because I've been doing this for 20 years, guys like Ricky and a lot of these other younger guys with their young minds and their young ideas, they can surpass you like this. You They're can't sleep. You, can, yeah. you guys are way more creative. You can't, we can't sleep on guys like Ricky either because listen, at the end of the day, yes, we're all friends. It's still it's somewhat of a competition. And every single dealer that walks into the industry today takes a little slice out of that pie we call, you know, the watch market. Yeah. Uh, what else do we want to talk about today? Nick, what else was on our agenda? Nick? Anyone? Nick? Oh, Bueller, Bueller. questions. Uh, can we pop some questions on the screen? We should take some questions and we're going to try to answer these collectively. Maybe we'll even let Ricky try to answer a few questions. Uh, Avi, can we put up the questions? You said they're going to they're gonna be on our screen. Avi, Bueller, and Salud, 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 salud. Salud. It's funny how we decided to talk about, literally, before uh, Nick wrote a script about watches of whiskey, and he said this is the number one question about new dealers, and he probably shows hey, up. <laughs> it's like, it's like you I call swear. me? You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't script this any better if you ask me. Uh, he, has I, to he has to teach me how to pull off that hat because I, I can't. I like that. I like that. Hat. <laughs> That's good. So That's speaking, good speaking of hats, by the way, guys, uh, I was told that uh, I'm going to be giving away five of these hats. This was from the last video where we announced uh, uh, five hat giveaways. So uh, pretty shortly, I think I was going to put something on my screen where I'm going to announce the guys that won that. And uh, we're waiting on Avi on. Um, we all decided to wear, uh, have a little bit of blue in our watches. Why don't we talk about what's on our wrist real quick? Well, I have. You keep calling. You keep calling this the RPG. The, it is. The it's RPG. not a rocket propelled grenade launcher. It's, it's a PSG, okay. by the way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Richard Meal RPG. <laughs> PSG God. <laughs> I, it's going to be. It, that's it. It's, it's forever known as the. You remember how Anna called the the Wimbledon, Wimbledon the doll the badminton doll? It's forever the badminton doll. It doesn't stop. What do you got? Oh, I just got the old school. I feel like wearing an offshore today. So got the old school navy. Yeah, man, these things have blown up in price. Insane. Like, ridiculous. Insane. Unbelievable. What are they at Keep now? Keep it going. Uh, high I'm teens, low 20s. I mean, pending condition and all types of I'm things. I'm wearing a solid gold Smurf. Yeah. Smurf. Love it. Discontinued dial. Love I'm, I'm telling you, they're going to think this is set up. We're all wearing blue watches. <laughs> I got a brand new dealer that should show up on the show. It's the best. Nick, what else What else did we have on the topic? On our, we talked about becoming a new dealer. We got lucky with Ricky showing up because he happens to be one of those new dealers that reached out to me a year ago. Uh, we talked about the podcast. We talked about uh, you know watches and whiskey going live. So now we got. I know we got to give these away. You guys are supposed to be. And now it's, it tells me look on the screen. Uh, where am I looking, Abby? Which, Roman, by which the way, am I looking at? Shout out for my boy from LA. I'm not going to name any names, but he said that this market is going to continue forever. So don't knock his hustle. Well, me from, from his Rolexes. from his words to God's ears. Yeah, I don't see the questions maybe I'm having technical difficulties uh, private chat maybe I gotta move that away hey Roman oh here we go hey Roman what do you think about oh, I see it now I see it I see it I see them all right so hey Roman uh, this question comes from Tim and Tim asks hey Roman what do you think about HYT watches aren't they incredible with their hydro technology did you ever trade them I'll tell you something about HYT watches these things came out of the Piece gate. Piece of shit. Excuse my language. So why you gotta give away the answer? Sorry, it is. <laughs> Every single one we've had has just been a lemon. They all, all right, so oh my God. When they Pardon. first got announced, and when, when, they, when, they, when they first got announced and they came out of the gate, when I looked at the watch, I looked at the technology, I looked at the physical watch, I was like, wow. I was super impressed. Now, mind you, this technology wow. did exist. Uh, Concord, remember that crazy Concord we had for like a million dollars? It had a power reserve that was also liquid propelled. So it had a power reserve that the liquid would fill up to show up. Right up. So it wasn't like the first time I saw that. But the way they did in Showtime, it was great. And I was actually happy. They came out of the gate expensive, 60,000 retail, 70,000 retail. And I said, this is going to do well. It's so different. The technology is so cool. And not every single one of them broke. Every so they, like, they came out of the gate and then and they just one. tripped and fell. And they never recovered since that. Because I've said this before, it's much like... It can happen to anyone, including Patek Philippe. Like there are certain paddocks that were trading at 5960 platinum before the 08 crash, trading upwards of ninety thousand dollars. Crash happened; these things went down to forty thousand dollars, and they were really recovered. Never, because yeah. once you trip in the watch industry, it's very, very hard to recover. I, I can't really think of any model that has recovered after taking such a such a hit. Not one single model. 
Uh, Anything that's been going up has just been consistently going up. Nothing that's went to a crazy range. No, well, hold on a second. You, at the time that the 5960 took a dump, you know, your 5980s, uh, you know, were trading at around, I know it sounds funny, 65,000, which was a lot for that time. We we're going back to 14. What was this? Uh, this is 07, 08. You, okay. you you were still in grade school. About the stainless steel ones? <laughs> yeah. Back back in uh back before they the were crash, way less than that. No, they were the highest ones I saw was sixty five thousand dollars. The average market price dealer to dealer was about fifty eight to sixty thousand. For fifty nine eighty. Fifty nine eighty steel. Stainless steel. Yeah. Then no, never when the when the when crash happened, they went down to thirty and even under thirty. And what really lifted that model back up and why the Nautilus continued back up is when the guys started icing them out. That was the first draw that made those watches go back up. The guys at 47 just tried to bind them up, started icing them out, and that propelled that model. It could have been, it could have had the same fate as, fate as this 5960 in platinum. We don't know, but I know that icing those watches out sort of propelled the 5711s initially, the 5980s, and then it was something else that sort of mm -hmm. took them to that next level. Let's go to another question. Wait, what do I usually say? Tim, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> I haven't done that in a while. All right. Roman Sharp, do you see this is from, I can't read that. Somebody can bring me my glasses. Who is that from? Sam Ray? That Sam says? Ray. Sam Ray asks, hey Roman, do you see value in AP 1159s? Wanna, wanna take that one? I will say actually, yes. I do see the, the movement and I would say the perpetual that they made, the original one with the oh, adventuring dial. Yeah. Unbelievable watch. Is there value in it? Yeah, there's value. I think the watch is definitely worth what the retail price is of the watch if you, if you compare it to its to its uh, comparable models, you know, Royal Oaks, Royal Oak Offshores. I mean, there's a lot more complication, updated movements. It's just, it doesn't have that Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore design. And it's a, it's oh, a no, if you look at it from the side, it looks like there's a Royal Oak sandwich in between two yeah, things. So some, some of them were actually really good. And, I mean, really cool. I actually really like them. So the problem with the question of value is that, you know, the meaning of the word value in today's market is so skewed based on the fact that there's so many hype models out there that are trading a double, triple their retail value. How do you even define value? If, from a horological perspective, I agree Absolutely. with you 100%. Yep. There's ridiculous value in code 11. Yes, from the plain one to the perpetual, how about the newer skeleton turbines? Or the, or the flying turbines? The, oh my God, Sick. In, insane watches. So from a horological perspective, yes, there's definitely value. Is this something that you're gonna go out, buy it, list, put it on your wrist and not lose money? No. Yeah. Will there be a time that uh, code 1159s will go over list? Probably not, there's not a whole lot of watches out there. If they don't start out of the gate hot, they don't get hot. They, they thought they thought they were gonna have success with the remaster, and I called it from the from the jump that it was gonna be a flop, and that's exactly what it is. And uh, and I, I'm actually I'm actually a fan of that watch. You had somebody call in and ask you how much for that watch when it first came out. Yeah, then no, like I, over a hundred thousand. I basically something. gave him a whole dissertation as to why I think this watch is not worth what you're asking for. And he's like, oh, okay, I would love you. to have found the original <laughs> watch though. That would be a, oh, that would well, be a okay. great watch to find. Yeah. Let's go to another question. This one is from. Please, somebody read that. You want, let, me, let, me, let me handle it from here, Roman. Yes, thank you. <laughs> cool. help you out there. Yeah, they didn't give me my glasses. I can't see that. This question is from Sistec. If you could change one thing about your company without losing anything, what would it be? Shit. Uh, Can I answer? Yes. Mm. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer? Mm. Endless bank account. <laughs> that's I mean, what I mean that's, I that's, that's 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 a little cheesy. You have to you have to be a, a little bit realistic. If there's if we're talking about today, if there's what okay, I I wouldn't say about our company. One thing that I wish I could change in the industry as a whole is shipping and logistics. Oh my that God, is that probably nightmare. That is probably the most difficult thing to face, especially when you're doing a lot of international business and a lot of new insurance policies that come into in, into play and. Valuations. It's. It's. There. There's. There's so many things that I think that shipping and logistics can do better on their end. You know, a lot of countries. You know, we don't do a lot of business with people overseas in Europe or you know, Australia. But now you're getting into VAT and stuff but, like but that. But that. That's something that I would change because what happens is, is people start doing illegal things, start smuggling, and, and it actually hurts the countries that are trying to make the money off the VAT. Yeah. So. Why wouldn't Why wouldn't these countries yeah. like you know or say look country, when it comes to goods over ten thousand dollars, pay three percent? Like you know, whenever we import a watch, we just imported a, a one uh, two million dollar watch into yeah. here. Our duties were. Seventeen hundred dollars, exactly. right? By proper try, that, try going into Germany with that. Yeah, you're, you're pay paying four hundred grand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so I agree with that. But that's really not changing the one thing about the company. Uh, honestly, I probably want to throw a story there on that regarding shipping and logistics. I remember I sold one of these watches internationally. At, I think I told you a story. I sent to Australia. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the old vampire with the alligator mm -hmm. strap. And I shipped it out, and I put on the commercial invoice that I'm shipping a watch with alligator strap. Ah. Oh. 
Wait. Like, I almost. I remember. I remember. He called me up, flipping out, and I told him about CITES, and I told him yeah, about yeah. you know, pr you know, uh, fish and wildlife. Yeah, oh guys, God. that fish and wildlife is a nightmare in the United States. I literally mother of pearl. Uh, it sometimes it's easier for me to buy a watch and say, just take off the strap, I'll buy a new strap here and add it to the cost. Because importing an alligator strap into the United States is like bringing a monkey through customs when you're coming back from, <laughs> from a party. It's, it's an, it, or, or having an apple in your backpack, right? But I do, I do have something about our company that I would change. Uh, one word, location. And coming I'll, soon. And, <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll explain why. Uh, never was the goal of this company right. to be visible to the public, to have a, a retail operation, to be open to the public, have people come in and out. Uh, yep. Over the last a year, year and a half, two years, we've gotten so much spotlight that, you know what, if I wasn't on an industrial, I'm sure when you pulled up, you'll help. Where am I, right? <laughs> industrial Boulevard, right? I mean, a bunch of industrial buildings around us. You, doesn't, you don't see Luxury Bazaar anymore when you pull up to our building. You really don't know what to expect. I think at this point in the game, two things I would change about our company's location. I think if we were somewhere in the Brickle, uh, Vegas, I'm not so sure about. Probably most likely Miami would be a good spot just because we happen to love Miami. So that would be the one thing we would change. And the last thing, last thing that I, I will say is, and we've all agreed on multiple occasions after many trial and errors, the website. Obviously, there's a new website that's coming out because the one that we have right now, that's the one. Yeah, thing. we're going to. That's probably the main thing I would change. Because, because, because right now we're, uh, you know, because this company started with the formula that's 20 years old of selling pictures, right? That is no longer something that works for today's internet. So we're going to go to a model where it's going to be, you know, we're not going to be selling pictures anymore. We're going to slowly, surely get away from them. Yes. Am I always going to keep up a Rolex Submariner on my website? Obviously, I will. But some of the other stuff that usually we order and things of that nature, we're, we're going to get away with that. We're about 30 days away from the launch of a newer website. Uh, you're not going to see many changes in terms of, uh, you know, what it looks like. It's just, uh, you know, better software, more robust, faster, things of that nature. Uh, this is a question Here, for you. all you guys. This is a question for all you guys. What Brum, would be your up, This is a question from Grazel. This is a question for all you guys. What would be your starter watch that's under 10K? You just said it. Rolex Amer. Not on Not on Not a new one. Um, Look, I've always, I've always gone new, back. The, the new, new Tudor Chrono. I think it's a sleeper. The Panda Dial. Tudor Chrono that came out. That's a good Excellent one. Excellent watch. I like that. What, what's the trading like? Seventy-five, give or take. Yeah, I like I like going backwards. Look, I've always called you know, and I'm not the one that came up with that. Rolex is your first money watch. There's always a Rolex out there for under ten thousand dollars. Be it an older Datejust, be it an older two tone something or other, be it an oldest even sub at this point, right? You can find an older sub. You can find a yeah, pre uh, a non ceramic, you know, sub exact kind of condition. Exactly, even an, an old, a much older two tone sub. 9500 you can find one again no maybe i'm thinking buckle, yeah. no go through the buckle some of the older stuff so if if depends on what you're looking for if you're looking for uh recognition rolex is the first money watch right so you can always find a rolex under ten thousand dollars how long wow. that's going to last i don't know uh in terms of value I, i'll agree with the tutor what would you pick rolex rolex yeah because it's just it's that there's a reason rolex is number one so yeah there's there's your answer what else we have Next order. question. Watch. Oh, here. Well, right, right, right. What are, this is from Mark P. Roman, what is the biggest risk to the watch market at the moment? It's the overall economy. I mean, I'll tell you what the biggest risk to the watch market at the moment. If you said crypto, I swear to God, I'm walking out. <laughs> I'm crypto. I would say the biggest risk to the watch market at the moment has to do amongst us dealers in the gray market and what have you. Since we control the prices by having the inventory, it is up to us to keep prices at a at a healthy, respectable level. Because as soon as there's any type of panic, the panic starts with us. Sure. If if this watch, let's say, market value is three hundred seventy-five thousand, and there's a hundred of them, and twenty of them are on the market, and a few people have them, and today I need money, I say I need to dump this watch, I need to dump it quick. And if I dump it for let's say two hundred seventy-five thousand, well, guess what? The rest of the market catches on very quickly. So it's I think a ripple that, effect. So it's a ripple effect. So the most important thing is dealers to hold their prices strong. I think that to add to that, um, I actually had a conversation with somebody the other day about market and where it's going because somebody calls me up and like, oh, it seems like the market has slowed down. And I'm telling, and my answer to the guy was, it's, it's summer, it's, man. It's, it's July. <laughs> We're chilling. Right? You We're know, chilling. We're drinking. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's July and market, but the problem in the high market such as this, 
and those that are holding the hype inventory, all the hot Royal Oaks, the, all the hot Richard Meals, it's things that have a higher price ticket. Uh, even a small slowdown, <clears throat> which is natural for July. July going into August yeah. is probably some of the slowest times of the year, right? People are away. COVID is over. People are traveling. You yeah. know, nobody's thinking about watches. You know, nobody's out there. You know, uh, you know, trading stuff. So, in a market such as this, even a natural slowdown of let's say that of July, which happens every year. If you look at my books in the last twenty years, you'll see that July and August and January are the three shittiest months of the year, right? So, uh, the end of August starts to pick up. September mm -hmm. gets strong towards Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, but in a market like this, even a July slowdown, which is natural, can still cause a little bit of panic, right? Even for guys like us that have been doing this for a long time, like we had a first slow couple of weeks in July, like me and you were sitting there like, oh shit, we gotta do something. And we're like, well, it's July. And then all of a sudden, one week of a couple big purchases and big sales. Just totally. and, that's, and, that, and that's the beautiful thing about our, our business is sometimes you can't really forecast what's gonna happen tomorrow. You know, I'll wake up and one day will be extremely slow and then the next day some big hit will happen, some big purchase will happen, some big S trade will speaking happen. Of which, you never know. Speaking of which, did the wire hit? We'll see after. Uh, <laughs> we'll see after. We're, we're waiting on a pretty substantial wire. Yeah. And uh, if that hits, we can go home early. Nah. Nah. <laughs> yeah, nah. I don't think so. I want to add something to that before you go to an next yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot. What were you talking about? What kind of whiskey can you give me, bro? <laughs> why don't you pour? Why don't you think about what you wanted to say and pour it Asian and stuff? Yeah. Well, I think. Yeah, I remember now. See, it was a whiskey problem. See. <laughs> How often do you think this happens? I bought a watch from a retail client, right? I sold it to a dealer. Then about, I'll say a month later, I needed a watch for another customer. Mm. And I put it in the call, somebody offered me a watch. And I go look at the watch. It's your watch. <laughs> That's my watch. Oh my God. And I paid like 2000 more. But it went to one dealer that I sold to, to another dealer, to another dealer and then back to me. I have a better question. I have a better answer for you. How often, you know what else happened? That happens to us often. You know what else happens to us? I call Ricky and say, yo, I got this couture. It costs you $2. Ricky's like, well, I can't really afford this watch right now, but I think I know somebody that wants it. Ricky calls another dealer, says, yo, I got this special watch. Couture, you can't find them. Five year fucking waiting list, right? This, that, and the other. He goes, hmm, I really don't know much about it, but it seems like a really cool watch and a good value for $3. He calls another dealer says, yo, I'm gonna sell you this watch for 350. It's a smoking deal, retail is stupid high. The dealer goes, you know what? I got a guy for it. Hello? Am I interested in the Quatour? Uh, how much? Four dollars. I'm like, can I sell you one for a dollar fifty? You know, it, it, my own watches just oftentimes a, just make a circle without even being sold to get reoffered back, back to you. So, so what you just described happens fairly often. How many times have I sold a watch and 30 seconds later I needed that watch and I'm just like, bro, here's you know whatever five percent profit. I need that watch back. This just ha this just happened to me. There's a certain Richard Mille that's that's being advertised to a bunch of different people. Um, and I know it's the same watch. It started being offered, and it's, and it's crazy how this happened. It started being offered amongst people that I had no idea had anything to do with Richard Mille watches. Just end users, so, you know, one's a doctor, one's a something <laughs> like this. This watch w was offered to me from, it went from 780 to 790 to 810 and all the way to me yesterday to 890. And I said, would you like one for 750? You know, and that's what happens. Now, As it's exchanged through hands, the price That grows. actually brings up a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. And I tell my clients the same thing. Oftentimes you'll find a client. Look, not clients are loyal, but I always tell my clients, feel please shop around. Value what you're buying and whom you're buying from. Value the dealer, obviously first and foremost. But look, if I'm giving you a watch for ten grand and there's somebody out there that's able to do it for nine grand because you have to have bought it better or just happened to got it a better deal in a package, whatever maybe I can't always be the best priced, right? But I always tell them one thing, especially on visible pieces like Richard Meals or some of the more expensive things, the minute the client goes to shop around, the price goes up just like this. And then the client calls me back, like, I'll take that deal. And I'd be like, well, you won't. Because the watch, you just you just inquired the entire world about it. And the minute there's demand on the market, prices go up. So the watch you originally wanted to buy for 300 is not going to cost you 320. Yep. Because you, not because I want to charge you 20 grand more, because you shopped it around. And the one guy that has it so thinks I can get more there's, for 20, it now. there's yeah. 20 people looking for it when in reality it's one person. That's why I would tell my guys to shop it around to an extent. But when it comes to really, really visible pieces, make a decision who you're going to buy it from first and foremost, and they'll go shopping because your price is going to end up going up because of this very reason. What else we got over here? Any other questions? There's a few. This is from uh, Derek T. Not Derek, Derek T. Roman and Adrian, if you could travel back in time and see yourself when you were 20, what advice would you give yourself? Isn't Ricky 20? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> oh, man. Obviously some new financial stock picks. <laughs> then put all my money in, in Bitcoin. Let's be whatever. realistic. Let's not make it like back to the future. How about, you know, knowing what you know today, you know, what would you do? Because at the age of 20, you were you were a buck wild. I remember you at the age of 20, so. Um, you know, I, 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 say, I say this again, and I, I, I keep saying this, I'm going to say it again. I wish I got an earlier jump start on social media, on YouTube. I, I, w I wish we did this earlier. I really do. Okay. Not that we're not not that we're late to the game, right? I mean, at, I at twenty, I was stationed at Fort Knox, Kentucky. I was yeah. in the military, and I'll tell you one thing about my military career: the three years that I spent in the military, the one advice I would give my my twenty year old self, while I wouldn't change anything, I would still go to the military. I would still continue the path that I continued, corporate world, and all going on on my own. I learned a lot from my military career, from my corporate career. I I achieved a lot in both, and. For me, I wouldn't change that aspect of it because we're not making it magical. But the one advice I would give myself at 20 is the value of money. In the military, at the time, my paycheck was $2,000 a month, $2,500 a month or whatever it was, but I had no expenses. My living was paid for. I got three meals a day. I got clothing allowances, so I didn't need to spend any money. I literally could have just not spent a dollar. And I would have given myself an advice on the value of money. If I would have, the three years I spent in the military, if I would have put away twenty, thirty thousand dollars instead of going out there and spending it on stupid stuff like, young, you know, like young kids, you did the same. So you, don't, you, don't know, you don't know what I did to him when he was twenty years old. I literally took his Amex, and he, when he started making good money, let me finish my story first. So I, so I would give myself an advice on to save up some of that money. I'm not saying being a cheap ass. I'm not saying don't go out there and enjoy, you know, certain things, but to an extent to where it's not like, you know, where I'm spending 90% of my money on dumb shit. So, and collect up that money because I now realize the value of money, how money makes money specifically in our business today. And maybe if I did that, I'd be working for myself a lot earlier than I did. As far as Adrian is concerned, when Adrian started making the money that he started making, money he has never made before as a salesperson, you know, it went to his head. He's a young kid, he's out there partying, popping bottles in clubs, this, and the other, he's not married, he's not dating. I called him into my office one day and I said, come here. Give me the login to your Amex, to your two or three credit cards. Give me all the logins and your bank. He's like, I'm like, give me. Long story short, I log in. I pull down the reports from his Amex. And then, you know, credit cards, they give you pretty fancy reports. You can categorize stuff, this, that. I'm like, Adrian, last month, I remember this I remember this so specific. He made that month. He had a badass month. He made like $11,000 that month. That was a lot of money at the time. <laughs> we're, going, we're going back more than 10 years, right? So. He made 11 grand and changed that month. And I'm looking, I'm like, yo, check this out, Adrian. Let me not put it to you in dollars. Let me put it to you in perspective. 88% <laughs> of your last month income went to, like, pop, went, like to, <laughs> went to popping bottles, right? I mean, because Adrian is in the club with all his boys, ordering this and ordering that, so having a good old time. Like, 88%. Yeah. It was that day when I literally started holding money back. Like, he would make 10 grand that month. I would take $5,000 and just not give it to him. He's like, what do you mean? I'm just, I'm not giving it to him. That lasted almost a year. So hold. You know what I mean? But then he finally he understood. And it's not like I was just like, oh, I'm this perfect person. When I got married, I was $30,000 in debt because I was single. I was partying on this before I, leading up to getting married. I was making good money. You know what I mean? Half my money was in my closet. The other half was in my car. You know what I mean? But I was living it up just like him. But because I was already there and I knew, you know, where it leads, I, I figured I'd just kind of stop him. I may have to take this call. Is that him? Yeah, I got it. All right, go ahead. I'll be back in a few minutes, ladies and gentlemen. So we're telling, so we're telling what's going on? Yeah, no. Duty calls. Big deal. Big deal on the table. Let's take some more questions. Super chat. Is this live? Prove me wrong. I didn't waste $40. I am not sure how to answer that. Yes, this is live. And you're not wrong. <laughs> okay. What's the next question? <laughs> Anyone? Hello, Joe. You always say it's so hard to get a richer meal. So why are there so many on Corona 24? Uh, Ricky, percentage-wise, if I to, let's say let's call it there's 100 meals on Corona 24. How many of those you think are live watches? How many of those you think are pictures? How many? How many you say they are? Let's just say, assume there's 100 richer meals. There's more than 100. Let's say, assume there's 100 richer meals on Corona 24 today. How many of those do you feel are pictures? How many of those are actually in stock? I'll say 20 in stock. 20 in stock. So there you have. There's your answer. You have to understand something. It's very easy to utilize a platform like Corona24 to put out a hot watch and to wheel in the customer. 
because the network connections that we have from a youngest dealer to the oldest dealer, both me and Ricky can get out on the chats and find that richer meal. If you notice the prices are inflated because of that, because what do you do? You cover yourself, right? You don't want to put your richer meal out there for hundred grand and you know the market is 150. Sometimes you find pieces on there that are underpriced, like really underpriced. When somebody says, hey, beat this price. I'm like, well, that's a listing that a guy put up three months ago. The price has changed over. So to answer your question, there's not that many richer meals out there. It's a, there's just not. And believe me when I tell you, I know where most of the richer meal stock is. I know it's, it's between specific dealers that specialize in nothing but richer meals. Lately, you know, I was the guy that used to have 20, 30 richer meals in stock at one time. At this point, I choose not to have as many. I don't think my richer meal inventory will go over more than five pieces at any given time. And I'll tell you why. Return on investment. Remember, guys, I told you numerous times, we're at a point where I'm not looking at, oh, I just sold a richer meal and I made 10 grand. Wow, big hit. But if the cost of that richer meal is $400,000, what did I make 2% on my money, right? That's how I kind of look at it. It gets to a point in the market when certain things get so hot that a return on investment is not worth putting the money into. Because to get out there and buy 10 richer meals today, it's $3 million either way you slice it. And that's on the low end, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, unless I'm getting a really good deal and I'm able to make the return on my investment, that's when you'll see that richer meal in stock, but then flies out the window anyway, because richer meals are hot. Uh, let's see. Uh, hat winner's time. All right, well, first of all, the email is james at luxurybazaar.com for your information. And the winners are Avi. Let's see. I got Avi hosting this from another room, and he's telling me it's hat winner's time, but he's not giving me the names. Oh, it's on the screen. Winner one is Andy. The comment is this smells like Golden Gates. Only Northeast Philadelphia people are going to get this joke. I think he was referring when I talked about that every single Russian in the Northeast had a Lexus GS300 or a Nissan Maxima and a Rolex they just on their wrist. Yes. So Andy, uh, email James at Luxury Bazaar and we'll send you one of these. Winner two is Sammy A. Real watch show on YouTube. Thank you. Oh no, best watch show. Somebody bring me my glasses. I mean, I feel like an ass right now. Uh, they're on my desk, please. So, Sammy A, shoot an email, we'll get you the hat. Winner number three is Nick Smith. Brilliant production, guys. Who needs... Ricky, what does that say? Who needs... Cable. Who needs cable? Thank you. I'm old. Yeah. Abby, by the way, shout out to my CMO, Abby, for making this so freaking tiny. Winner number four is Kyle, who said, all right, you got me hooked. Love this channel. What did I miss? Since I was I'm giving away hats. Oh. One more winner, please. Another winner is Ian Mone, Monch, Mo, Monch. Forgive me if I butcher your name yes. completely. Uh, it's M-O-E-N-C-H. Mo I have no idea how you guys don't have more subscribers. Great content because we don't buy subscribers. Um, thank you. I can see this. Wow, this when was babe, the last bad boy? She's like, this shit's like HD. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, uh, it's been an hour. We're gonna, we said we're going to promise we're going to keep this to an hour. As I told you before, just a quick recap. Q&A didn't disappear. We're going to put it into a podcast format. We'll keep you guys informed. Uh, there'll be more information on the Gray Market Group on Facebook. You, those of you that haven't joined yet, please join. It's a fun place to be. No haters, no bullshit. It's just a cool place to hang out. Sure, if you watch us, talk about watches with others. Uh, Watches and whiskey, we're going to do this live every time to reduce the production time for our videography team, for our video team, for them not to, you know, quit. Yeah, and if you guys have any, cool. if you guys have any recommendations on things for us to discuss on watches and whiskey, that's always a help because it's always kind of, with this, today was kind of off the cuff. Yeah, we're, it wasn't and scripted, whiskey's so. and watch. Whiskey's and watch. <laughs> uh, with, that, with, that, with that said, oh, by the way, apologies for not showing you any watches because if you look downstairs right now, we're actually, going to a trade show. We're going so. to a trade show, so yeah. our watches were all in bins, backed up, ready to fly to Florida. I think they already actually picked them up, so really couldn't show you much. Uh, normally we would, as usual. Uh, any suggestions? I do like that idea. I do like doing this off the cuff. I do like the fact we didn't plan on having a guest. Uh, I didn't find out that Ricky is going to fly until yesterday. This was planned beforehand. So it was nice to have him. And it, I love it how you fit in to the one question, that, the one topic that <laughs> we actually make, planned make, on make discussing. Make sure you tell the people what your Instagram is. It's, uh, it's, it's almost a shirt. Look at that. It's right here. You know people are going to ask you for that shirt now. You can read it on here. The watch one watch one on one. You know people, are, people are going to ask you for that shirt now. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give some away. Why not? So make sure. Thank you, you for you, having me. Yeah, no problem. Make sure you guys give Ricky a follow. Just the same. A young, successful watch dealer. Great story. Uh, other than that, uh, what do we say, guys? Thank you for tuning in. As usual, 
like, share, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks on Watches and Whiskey. <laughs> this is good. And uh, we'll see you on Monday on Grey Market.